What's that knife for, Steven? So you know how when you quench steel, it gets super, super hard, right? Uh, we're going to take a look today if that is still true for stainless steels. This knife is made of stainless steel, like most knives are. It says it right there, stainless steel. Uh, technically, this would be a ferritic stainless steel. Maybe we'll cover what that means in a future video. But for now, we're just going to take a look at the hardness of this sample and then quench it and see if our hardness has gone up or stayed the same or what. So you would expect it the hardness goes higher if it was carbon steel, right? Most steel, that's true. You and quench then, it and you get a very, very hard structure, yeah. Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to put in the furnace, quench it, and see if that's true on the stainless steel. Okay, perfect. You got it. Let's try it out. All right. This is a Rockwell B hardness tester. We're using a 1 16th inch ball and 100 kilogram load to test the hardness of this stainless steel. I apply the preload, hit the start button to apply the major load. This is 100 kilograms being applied to that one small point. And then as the major load is released, the machine is automatically measuring how far out the indenter is pulling. A deeper indent means a softer material. In this case, we're reading 97.4 HRB. HRB because the ball. B. Yeah, and what is the load here? 100 kilogram first, okay. All right, so 94... 97.4 for our first test. Yeah. We'll do three just to make sure that we have some good accuracy. I'm doing this in different locations here as well along the knife. Ninety-seven point four was our first, ninety-six point seven for our second, so almost the same. One more indent near the base of the knife here, maybe, to take a look if there's any difference. And 96.4. Basically identical numbers. Some scatter if our hardness testing is very, very normal. And so these were almost identical values. It seems like this knife is pretty consistent and a reasonable reasonably hard material with 90 something HRB hardness. Let's throw it in the furnace and see if that changes. So you're getting ready to put the sample in the furnace? Yeah. We're going to heat it up to about 1700 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, 927 degrees Celsius, I think. Is that the temperature usually carbon still get austenized? The exact temperature that we would put our steel in depends on the carbon content of the steel, uh, but all regular, normal, non-stainless steels uh, would go through the necessary phase change at 910 degrees Celsius. So regardless of the carbon content, it's definitely getting hot enough here in order to cause that change to happen. And once we quench it, turn it into that really, really hard structure. Or maybe not, because stainless steel is different, but let's take a look. Well, wow, it's fairly hot. Is that? We'll leave it for half an hour to make sure that it actually does go through the changes that it needs to and then does some more. Perfect. All right, so we come back in half an hour and quench it. Perfect. All right. The sample's been in the furnace for half an hour now. Let's quench it. Nice, bright, red hot knife here. Oops. Can you see it? Quick. Wow, it's hot. Simple as that. Let's see. Oh, it seems a little bit oxidized on the surface, but More or less it's not shiny there. anymore. Yeah. Let's test the hardness and see if it had any effect. Uh, so, we quenched this uh, ferritic stainless steel here. And you can see there is a little bit of a change, just visually. We have a little bit of more of an oxide scale on the surface. It's not as shiny as it used to be, so that's kind of expected. Um, but I don't think we're going to see any difference in hardness. I'm going to test the exact same locations, just slightly away from the previous indents, and uh, get a good comparison here. It was the previous value? Previous values were around 96 or 97. And so it looks like quenching actually made it less hard. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But uh, it seems like it's around the same number, right? 
We had 96 or 97 before, we're down to 93. We may have lost a little bit of hardness, which is actually expected, but Is for now, expected? Okay. Well, we'll talk about that later. For now, we'll just say that the reason it's not getting extremely hard, a lot of steels would, right? Normal steel would create an extremely hard structure when it's quenched. That's what, you know, when the blacksmiths are doing when they quench their sword in water. 92.4, about the same. Uh, we're not getting that in this case because the, um, uh, the ferritic stainless steel that we have here never actually changes its structure as we heat it. The whole reason why regular steel actually does see that change at all is because at high temperature it changes its crystal structure. And when we quench it and force it to change back really, really quickly, it kind of locks everything in place and, and traps all the carbon. Um, in this case, ferritic stainless steel is the same no matter what temperature we hold it at. Increasing the temperature didn't actually change our structure, and so quenching it didn't do anything. It was already oh. the structure it wanted to be. Okay, so you mean there's a transition for carbon steel at certain temperature, or oh, again, let's get this one is 92, 92. So it's less 24. than the original value. So a little less than the original value. And maybe we should put it back in the furnace for a little while and see if we can make that even lower and talk about why that is. But yeah, there is a transition for regular steel, like you said. Uh, and we don't see that for our stainless steels because they don't actually go through that transition at all. They don't go through that crystal structure change. Oh, would you be able to show it on the phase diagram? That how it works? Sounds good. Okay, let's, let's go to the whiteboard. So quenching of our ferritic stainless steel did not increase the hardness. It caused our hardness to actually go down slightly. Talk about why that is in one second, but first, why does carbon steel get hard in the first place when we quench it? Why does quenching have that effect on regular steels? Uh, the reason comes down to what's going on with iron's crystal structure. Iron is actually a very special kind of metal. It's one of the few metals on Earth that actually has two different crystal structures depending on the conditions, or in this case, depending on the temperature. At low temperature, we call our iron ferrite. So this is a temperature curve right here saying that at lower temperature, below around 910 degrees Celsius, our uh, crystal structure is going to be known as ferrite, which we can also call a body center cubic structure. If I were to zoom in on the atoms there within my crystal structure, I would see something that looks like this, where I have atoms in a periodic arrangement, in a pattern, this is what a crystal structure is, with one atom in the body center. This is a body center cubic crystal structure or a BCC crystal structure. And so I can add here that my ferrite at lower temperature is a BCC structure. At high temperature for pure iron, about 910 degrees Celsius, we get into what's known as austenite or gamma. Austenite is a shifting of my atoms into a new position iron for whatever reason is more comfortable as a face center cubic structure at higher temperature. So above 910 degrees Celsius, iron would look more like this. We still see a similar arrangement of atoms on the corners, that's my cubic structure there, but now rather than having one atom in the body center, I have an atom centered on each face. Face center cubic or FCC structure. So to add to this, at high temperature, I'm forming austenite or FCC. There's some important differences between those crystal structures, but we're not going to go into super fine detail here. The key is, why does normal steel become super, super hard when we quench it? If I heat my material up, most steels will turn into this FCC structure, right? And when that happens, any carbon that happens to be within my structure, all steels contain carbon, all that carbon gets dissolved into the structure. The carbon actually fits between the atoms at what is known as interstitial sites. My FCC structure has large space between the atoms, lots of space to fit that carbon. The trick is that when I cool my material down into the BCC zone, my carbon needs to come out. My carbon can't fit anymore because there aren't as big spaces between the atoms and the BCC structure. And so, carbon will come out usually to form iron carbonate. This is what would happen if we slowly cool our material. This iron carbide gives that material some amount of strength. But cooling it quickly, raising it to a high temperature, dissolving my carbon and then cooling it quickly down into the BCC zone, that forces my carbon to stay stuck within the structure, stretching it all out and making it extremely, extremely hard. 
There's a bit more detail to it than that, but that's the basics, saying that my, my quenched steel becomes extremely hard because of that transformation. It's because iron is special and has that, uh, that change from one crystal structure to another. Quenching aluminum, for example, you wouldn't see that because aluminum is always a face center cubic structure. It doesn't go through a change, right? It's the change that causes that hardening during that fast cool. So why didn't our stainless steel see that? So we just said why a carbon steel would harden when quenched. So let's take a look at this diagram to figure out why that wouldn't happen for a stainless steel. This is called an iron chromium phase diagram. And as our chromium content increases, it's going to change how my material behaves. And so we can see with 0% chromium, this is what we were looking at a second ago, right? Where I have pure iron that turns into this FCC crystal structure at high temperature and a BCC crystal structure at low temperature, right? At 910 degrees Celsius, just like we saw on the other diagram. So there you go. A plain steel with no chromium in it is going to go through that transformation and go through that, uh, that, that change if quenched quickly to, uh, to create that very hard structure. Let's add a bunch more chromium. As I add more and more and more chromium, up to around 16 to 18% chrome is where our knife was probably around that level, we can start to see that things change. We're no longer forming a FCC structure at high temperature. As we start down here, we're ferrite, BCC, and as we heat up, still ferrite, still ferrite, still ferrite, still ferrite, all the way up to liquid. There is no change anymore. And so when we heated up our knife, we heated it up to here, it's BCC, and then we quenched it to BCC. There was no change and therefore no hardening. So even if we go higher temperature, the result would be the same. Exactly. The only way that we can change anything is if we get all the way up to liquid, if we melt this material at like 1500 degrees Celsius, but we weren't even close to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so stainless steel with all that chromium in it, chromium ends up stabilizing that ferrite. Chromium itself is a BCC metal. And the more chromium we add to iron, the more that the iron wants to stay as BCC because the chromium kind of gets a vote, if you like, and votes for the BCC structure. So that's why we end up seeing that the whole way through and don't see that change. But what we will see is some grain growth. So we're talking about grain growth. What does that really mean? What do we mean when we say that? So uh, I said earlier that when a metal is in the solid state, it forms a crystal, right? Which might not be very obvious when you look at a metal, but zooming in on the atoms, you would see something like this, a repeating kind of structure there, right? Um, in fact, you see many, many, many individual crystals all coming together to make your one piece of metal, maybe a million of them, which is why metals don't really look like crystals when we zo sort of zoom way out. But zooming in a little way, we can see these individual crystals that form. As my metal solidifies, it's going to create one crystal here. And if I was able to zoom in and see the individual atoms in here, I'd see they were all in this regular kind of pattern. But it's not going to be the only one. There's going to be another crystal kind of right next to it. And they have the same kind of crystal structure. They're both BCC, for example but they're at a slightly different orientation. And so these crystals are growing this way, and another crystal is growing that way. And when they grow into each other, they can't join together because they're just at a slightly different angle, right? And so we end up with multiple of these crystals kind of sitting next to each other. These are what we call grains. This is a grain here, that's a grain there, that's a grain there, right? <clears throat> The important thing to understand with grain growth, and the reason why these crystals are going to grow when we heat our material up, is actually because of the boundary between them, what we call the grain boundary. This grain boundary, the separation between them here, is not part of either of the crystals that it's next to. It's next to this neighbor here, it's next to this neighbor here, but can't quite join either of those crystals. And so it ends up looking something like this. <coughs> Here's my beautiful pattern here, my crystalline arrangement, right? Another crystal growing down here at a slightly different angle. And a bunch of atoms in between that can't quite join one or the other, right? This is what our grain boundary actually looks like. And it's probably only a few atoms thick, but it is a really, really important thing. This, the crystal, is what my metal actually wants to do. This is what this grain boundary is being forced to do, but it's not very happy about it. And given the chance, these atoms would like to join a crystal too, right? 
And so given the chance, what that means is they need to be able to move around. We have to get some kind of diffusion going on, which requires heat. If we heat our material up, these, uh, these grain boundary atoms, these atoms that are kind of in this messed up state, are going to start joining the crystals, ultimately growing that crystal up, growing the grains. And so if we can head back over here, these three crystals, given some diffusion, or in other words, heat is really what we're talking about here. So if I heat my material up, these, what used to be three grains, might now just be one really big one. So they join, sort of, by diffusion, they join together. Join together. So when they become bigger, then technically they are softer, is that what you're saying? Well, that's what we actually found, right? Yeah. So as I heated my material up, I got this grain row that it apparently became softer. Why? That's worth talking about here too. The grain boundary has a pretty interesting effect on our strength. When I pull on my material, when I start to deform it, whether I'm you know, doing my little hardness indent or doing a tension test or whatever, when I pull on my material, what I'm actually doing is getting these atoms to slide past each other. And within the crystal, that's relatively easy to have happen. The crystal itself, these atoms are nicely lined up, and so it's relatively easy to have those atoms slide past each other. The grain boundary is not like that. The grain boundary actually helps us. It actually increases our strength. Because if I try to move these guys past each other, it's very bumpy, if you like, right? It's harder to move those atoms, which means the grain boundaries actually do give me increased strength and increased hardness. Growing my grains up, making fewer, larger grains, means less of these grain boundaries and overall less strength and hardness for my material. That's what we're actually seeing when we heat up our, our stainless steel. And if we were to heat our stainless steel up for longer, say for a day in the furnace, we should see even more grain growth and an even greater loss in hardness. Interesting. Maybe we should try that out. This knife has gone through two heating cycles now. Last time we tested it when it was just immediately quenched after half an hour in the furnace, a minor amount of grain growth. Now we're going to test it after one whole day sitting at high, high temperature. Uh, it was quenched afterwards, and you can see that it's got a little bit more of an oxide scale than it did last time. It's a little blacker than it used to be, if you like. Um, and we hypothesize, we suspect, that the hardness should have decreased even further. Let's take a look. Testing in the, th the same three locations here, slightly away from my previous indents. Uh, our first measurement without any heating was about... 96 or so. After half an hour of heating, it was about 92 or 93. I suspect it'll be even lower than that now. Wow. That's a big difference, right? 75, yes. 75. We've lost a lot of our hardness here, despite the fact that I quenched this right out of the furnace because of that grain growth, which is the only difference that that heating is making. We're not doing anything else to this material apart from just uh, growing those grains and reducing our hardness further and further and further. This location is slightly harder, but still a loss of hardness. Perhaps the grain growth has given us a bit more scatter, or that might be slightly related to the uh, larger, uh, the larger oxide layer. Let's do one more test to get a good average here. That one's even higher still, which is slightly interesting. But the, uh, the base of the blade seemed to have been a bit harder. So testing down here, it was in the 70s, in the 80s, and then up to 90 again. Still slightly softer than we got before, but not nearly as dramatic. That's it for our stainless steel for today. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.